Hi guys. Hello Facebook. Hello everyone. How's everyone doing? So we are here with the DS and Show and I uh, live from home. And uh, we're going to bring on a special guest to talk about some uh, issues and situations that we're dealing with right now. And um, we're going to have a, an important conversation. And um, we're going to talk about some things. We're definitely going to talk about some things with a special guest. As well as um, getting involved, speaking out, seeing what uh, we can do as people, as our community. Um, I really don't have any words. I'm kind of stuck. Uh, I just did an amazing interview. I got blocked from Instagram. So it kind of like dampered my moment and my mood right now. But... The show continues, and I'm going to bring on the amazing, amazing on-air personality, producer, host of 950 Lounge Radio Network, also marketing and media consultant, Mr. Kevin Pryor. Uh, we have collaborated on doing a town hall meeting on Zoom and Facebook on Monday with amazing, amazing individuals that are serving our community and uh, that are involved. So we're gonna talk about all of that. We're gonna talk about what it is to be a black man in 2020 in the United States, how everything is happening, how is it affecting him and our people, and solutions. And we're gonna try to do as much as possible on this live. So I'm gonna bring him in now, and we're gonna get started. Please share this. And uh, let's be open. You guys can uh, add comments below. Hello, hey. Kevin Pryor. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Where that am? Good evening. <laughs> How you doing? I'm okay. Getting through the day. Hey, listen. When 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 life throws you a curve, you know you swing at the fastball. That's all. Just keep moving. Absolutely. They can't. They nothing can shut your voice down. Just keep moving. Absolutely. How are we feeling today? What's going on? I'm good. Like, you know, obviously, uh, we spoke earlier, you know, because we, we speak a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, like a lot of folks, you know, um, things like this, while they're nothing new, unfortunately, it, 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 it brings you back to your own mortality. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when, when people die or people go through struggles, whether you understand them or not, it brings you to your own mortality. This hits home in so many levels because this is a man, this could have been anybody. I mean, I look at myself as a, you know, a black man, you know, relatively good shape, you know, somebody who's not gonna, who's got a voice. And that could have been anybody, you know? And, and then you find out more information that uh, the officer knew, um, you know, he knew him, they worked together. And, yep. and that's kind of scary that this might have been even more premeditated than we think. You know, I yeah. mean, it, it, enough, you killed the black man out of in cold blood, right in broad daylight. But to had already probably planned this, it's even more sadistic. Yeah. And it can even get more sadistic. Yeah. You know? What but I'm all right. You know, I, I did a workout right before this just to clear my head because I, you know, uh, it was, again, like a lot of emotions. And when those emotions are high, you even have to watch how you communicate to people and how you interact because, you know, emotions, things can come out. And again, you know, we're all not right. We're all annoyed. We're all tired, you know, and it's just uh, my way of clearing my head is to exercise and work out. I salute the ones on the front line. I really salute those people who are doing that you know, and it's funny, I was talking to my brother before this, and I said, you know, I'm definitely going to look to donate to the Mysons and uh, to Mika Mallory's because they need that. You know, for somebody to jump in a car and drive, I don't know, 20 hours to, to the Great Lakes, you know, leave your family in a pandemic, you know, we, we got to support that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, how are you feeling about the news of being charged, but in third degree. 
Well, the um, the the black man in me is is, is completely annoyed because again, you know, if 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 we know that he knew they knew each other, then um, prosecution they know. Right. But the 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 I guess the professional in me, the one who knows that the, it's a game, it's chess, not checkers. Realize you have to build this up. And um, my thing is obviously, I, I'm looking, I, I'm glad they arrested the, the main officer, but there's three others. And those three others need to be addressed um, as well. And, um, you know, but it, it's a step in the right direction. And I do believe, and I'm a believer of this because I'm a man of a certain age and I've seen just put a lot of times that, you know, civil unrest changes things. Yeah. Civil unrest changes things. And again, you know, whether you agree with stuff, property is property, um, that man can't come back. That man's family can't see him again. I think he had a, a, a child as well. That child don't have a father anymore. Out of something that anywhere in America, a uh, man of color, could be on the threat. I was just at, I was just watching Bobby, Bobby Simmons on live. So I told Bobby, "Be safe." Man. I, I, he assumed I was talking about COVID. No, we we got. I said, "Bobby, it's more than just COVID killing us. Be safe." You yeah. know, and I will continue to say that to people because again, it's just like when somebody tells you, "I love you," you can't hear that enough, in my opinion. Because right. again, we need that, and we can't take anything for granted. As a black man in the United States in twenty twenty. We've talked, we've spoken so many times. We even did a panel on the Diasin show in studio. And you've right. expressed some um, situations you've been in, even being young. Do you yeah. want to express anything about that? Do you want to tell at least one experience that was kind of very um, effective and still kind of traumatizing for you? Because sure. This, this I mean, um, become, you know, you, this is trauma. This is mental, physically, emotional trauma. Right. Well, you know, with me, the essence, and I, I mentioned it on your show, and I, I, I'll, re, I'll restate it again, that we're taught, you know, most people, 95% of people are taught to, you know, do the right thing, uh, respect authority, you know, uh, uh, go to school and uh, get educated and go to college and, you know, uh, do all the things you're told to do to be a productive person in society. Right. And again, that's something that, you know, was instilled in me by my mother and grandmother. And that's something I wanted to do. And one day, um, this is around this time, actually, um, many years ago, because it was, I was um, in eighth grade. And, um, you know, we had no classes. We were getting ready to graduate. Excuse me, ninth grade. We were getting ready to graduate to go to high school. We had no classes. Me and a friend were shooting hoops mm -hmm. at the local park. Um, you know, it was about, you know, 12, 12, 30 in the afternoon, shooting hoops, went and got two sundews, the, uh, the Gatorade of, uh, young black kids in my generation. We're walking home. And again, for those from New York, if you're from the Bronx, we're walking home on Bronxwood Avenue. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Bronxwood Avenue around, this is 225th, 226th Street mm -hmm. was a kind of a mosaic of, you know, black owned businesses, people who were blue collar, the barber shop, the, the candy store, the, the restaurant, uh, the grocery store, the beauty parlor was all pretty much right. African American at the time. And it was a situation where it was a self for pride because everybody knew everybody. They knew our mothers and what have you. Mm -hmm. And three officers pull up in a plain clothes car, pull us over. I can still remember, as I'm talking, I can still remember this gentleman, this officer's face. He pushed me on the on the concrete, knocks the basketball out my hand, <laughs> and um, says to me and my friend, "You guys, uh, you know, we ask him what we do, what we do." Pulls out his cuffs, cuffs us, and tells us, "You know, um, you know, we believe you guys were robbing houses." Now we're both sweaty. Um, I'm a sweater. I just worked out, and I'm still sweating. <laughs> I'm a sweater, and um, it's the middle. It's an eighty degree afternoon. So, and with a basketball in our hands. Now, again, I'm not a police officer and I'm not asking people to integrate my actions or believe what I'm saying. But I think, again, if I'm coming home sweaty with a sweatshirt, sweaty shirt and a basketball in my hand, a sundew, I don't know if I could have been robbing a house. Right. And, you know, 
to our credit, the, the people in the neighborhood, the store owners came out and was like, you know, these, these are good kids. Let them kids go. Let them kids go. And the officer, you know, through pressure of the community, let us go. But what it did to me, the effect it had on me is that for like about three years. So that's, um, I was in ninth. So up until 12th grade, I would not walk down that block. I would not walk down that block. Now, obviously, I was exonerated. People knew that, but I was so embarrassed and, and felt like, did I do something wrong? Did I, you know, why did they pull me over? My mother always said, do the right thing and be respectful and, and you know, yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And this happened to me. Now, again, there's people I know who've had a lot worse. But what I'm trying to say, I don't know a black man plus 30, me personally, that has not had a run in with the law, whether it's on the street, probable cause, um, getting pulled over multiple times because they got a nice car. And this has got to stop. The, the reality is that this has got to stop. And obviously, you know, there's solutions to it. We know it's wrong, but how do we fix it? That's the key moving forward. Right. Have you, we've been discussing and we came together, of course, that's family, but radio family. Uh, to right. make a difference through our platforms, and um, we are setting up a town hall on Monday um, for us to have a platform and have individuals come on and speak and express and, and start a action plan. Um, have you thought about any action plan? Has anything gone through your mind as we are setting up this process? Well, again, I think just like I mentioned to when we first started that we're all angry and we're all upset. And yeah. we're seeing that played out, you know, in HD TV right in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us, when we're angry, well, that's through a process of, you know, unlawful murder, or we have a disagreement with our significant other or our children or our friends, we sometimes lash out. But I think again, when you realize you have a problem, no matter how, high, what, how big the problem is, you have to find a solution. I'm a big believer that when we go through forms of adversity, we need to have more clarity because we are already emotional. Right. So with that being said, you know, my thought through this process, and I've said this for many years on my show and others, is that police officers, any, any community outreach person needs to be within the community. If we have our congressional people have to live in, a, in, our, in a district, why not our police? Why not the people who police and protect us and, 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 and support our rights and, and keep us, supposedly keep us safe, they should have an idea and a format about the people they're protecting. That's just like me working a job and not knowing the product I'm selling. How can I sell that product? How can I be successful if I don't know the ins and outs of that product? So if I'm selling something and I, and I don't know how to explain it to a customer, I'm not getting the sale. Case in point with police, if you don't know how to, to manage and deal with um, uh, people of a certain ethnicity or a certain uh, demographic or a certain uh, whatever it is, mm -hmm. then how could you work in that community? That's, that's step one. Absolutely. Step two is to educate and provide more services for our communities. We, again, growing up, you know, in the Northeast Bronx, you know, we didn't have a lot. But what we did have was people who reached out and said, you know what, let's give these young men something to do. So while we played sports and, you know, we, we worked on uh, hobby cars and different things of that nature, it was things to do. There's not a lot to do for these young kids today. And what has happened is that those young kids become young men mm -hmm. and the images and the things that we are portraying, and some of it we have to work on. It, it, it dumbs your mind. If, if you sit back all day and watch reality TV or listen to some of the music or some of the images, you know, that are out here, eventually that's going to teach you no matter what your mama is telling you at home. Right. Because again, we realize that we, we are prophets of our environment. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a momentum build. It's not one time you see something, you begin to say, ah, oh, that's just a movie or that's just music. I don't, I'm not following that. But if you constantly hear that, if you're seeing somebody wearing their pants off their ass constantly, you're going to continue. You're going to think that's, that's a symbolism. I should do right. that. So we have to educate our kids that it's something bigger out here. And that takes each individual. It's not always about money. It's great to have money. We need money. But it's going back and giving something to the community. Number three, which might be a sore spot for a lot of people, is generational wealth. 
Now, people might say, Kevin, that sounds easier said than done. I'm living in the projects. I don't have that. Well, Generation Wealth starts with getting insurance. Okay, maybe it doesn't do it for you, but your children, your children's children, you leave them a life insurance policy that maybe you pay $100 a month for that can cash out to be maybe a quarter of a million, 500000 and then it's 7 o'clock, so you know what that's about. Yep, I but, um, it's outside. It's all over here. Yeah. But again, generational wealth to help our next generation be better. If I'm somebody who struggled and worked hard and I had kids, and I'm, and anybody don't have kids because none of us have children, but I'm trying to leave something for the next generation, Absolutely. put some insurance. Absolutely. Again, it might not help me, but it helps my next generation. So we're not constantly in poverty. The projects were put together for people to have something post-war to go to, to live in. It wasn't designed for gent mama, daddy, grandma, granddaddy, big mama, big daddy, living in poverty. We have to look at the game. A lot of times we're playing chess and not checkers. We got to start playing chess. And that's that, it, again, that's it, funny, it, that's funny yeah. real quick. That's funny that you said, because I was just talking with Lenny Green, and he said the exact same thing. Yeah. We and have to do that. Yeah. Again, yeah. no disrespect to any community, but the police don't walk into a city, Jewish Brooklyn, and start putting people on the ground. And we have to remember every ethnicity has come from the ghetto. The, the Irish, the Jewish, the Italians. Why are we in this projection? And a lot of it, sometimes we have to look at ourselves. Now, we're not going to allow anybody to do what they're doing to us because this is wrong. Mm -hmm. But to every atrocity, there has to be some form of education. If we just sit back and say, okay, you know, Ahmaud Arbery and you know, now, um, you know, uh, in, in Minnesota, then, then we're the fools. First time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. So yeah. how do I get better? How do I put a situation in place where you just can't come into my community and, and do certain things, you know? It's got to stop, and it starts with us. And everybody's not built for the front line, and that's fine, because everybody can't be on a basketball team. Everybody can't be Michael Jordan. Right. But you can be the rebounder. You can be the guy chairman. You can be the coach. It's all the but team. everybody has a role. And that's why, you know, again, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I, 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 uh, I, I reach out to people to go find organizations that are doing good, that are giving back, that are putting it on the front line. Mm -hmm. And not just in normal times, because we've been talking for about 10, 15 minutes, and we haven't even once mentioned COVID. And that tells you how serious, you know, brutality and, and, and what we're going through is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, do you have any fear of what's next to come? Or do you feel positive that this is the, this is it? Like, this is it. Things are going to start changing. Because now everybody <laughs> really, it's, it's really in people's faces. And I, I, I mean, everybody's upset. I mean, even our... Uh, governor is upset at this point, and he's all about I think, I think that's a very good question, G. Essence. And my answer to that is I don't have time to fear. Okay. I can't wash this off. <laughs> you can't bleach it. I'm a black man in America. Mm -hmm. My father once told me, Rest his soul, that years ago, Kevin. At a very young age, when an age that maybe I should be believing still in the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus, my father pulled me inside and said, realize, boy, you got to be better than what everybody else is out here. And you got to realize that your blackness is a threat to some people. It doesn't matter how good a person you are, how that big, beautiful smile you got, or that personality, it ain't going to matter to some folks. You are a black man. And the earlier I teach you that, the more you realize. Now, again, some parents might say, I don't want to teach my child that. I don't want them to think they're, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, they, they, they're not good enough. And my father wasn't teaching me I'm not good enough. He was just preparing me mm -hmm. for what the real world is. This mm -hmm. is a black man that grew up um, in the 50s. Um, my grandparents marched on Washington and got water hoses on Wool at Woolworths. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up, that was, you know, again, I was aware of that and realized at a very young age that I got to go the extra mile. You know, when 
my Caucasian counterparts can, can go 50%, I got to go 150 when you know people look at me in business, and especially being in marketing and industries I've been in, I, and a lot of times been the only black person in the room. I've had to deal with substantial racism in my face, but they're not calling me the N-word, mm -hmm. but they're saying subtleties that I'm a, a smart person like I am realizes that. Absolutely. And you check people on that. And maybe that's why sometimes I've had to leave organizations that I've had success in because I refuse to sell my soul. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, we got one life to live. And unless you believe in Dion Warwick and reincarnation, I don't know. And if you do, God bless you. But in my, my opinion, you've got one time on this planet. And the only thing you got is your, <clears throat> and you, you know, what you come with and, 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 your, and your pride. Pride sometimes can get in the way. But at the end of the day, if you're not respected to yourself and who you are, then you'll fall for anything. So... Again, we, we have to be better. It starts with us looking in the mirror and realizing that we are worthy enough because a lot of us walk around and feel like we're not worthy. Mm -hmm. They don't say it. Um, I think, in my opinion, not to insult anybody, but I think in certain times, African Americans are still looking for white people's approval in a lot of things. And that's not to be a racist comment, but it's to say that, you know what, you are good enough. You know, you, you don't have to, when, when, when a young black man knows the pronunciation of a language, he's not acting white. He's being himself. That's, a, that's an insult to me. I've had that people, oh, well, you're not really black. Why? Because I know how to pronunciate words and put you in your place in a professional standing. No, I'm, I'm black. I'm proud to be black and wouldn't want it any other way. And we have to realize that, that we're not going to subside ourselves to anybody else and realize that we got to keep it within ourselves, not to be racist, but too Jewish Individuals can meet up in Brooklyn, not know each other, have a great conversation, and at the end of the conversation, could be doing business together or discussing how to do business. Absolutely. We got to stop our petty jealousies, these, these issues of light and dark, and, you know, I got a bigger car than you. We have to stop that. We have to come together and realize that what we are seeing now is a moment in time, but we should never forget these moments and realize that when we're in control to, to change our communities, our, our welfare, and our well-being. Have you felt that you've been affected in the marketing and sales because you're Black? Oh, without question. I mean, again, like I just mentioned, yeah. you know, there's nobody ever called me in my face that is have called me out of my name. But again, racism is not always about name calling. No. Racism is financial. Racism is professional standing. Racism is, is mentally and physically keeping you in your place. Yep. Years ago, I worked for a company. Um, there's still some friends that are on my Facebook, so I won't mention the company, but they know who it is. And um, I worked for an organization, an advertising organization, and um, was just as good as everybody else. But in agencies and certain businesses, you work with ad agencies and certain companies control the ad agencies. Mm -hmm. So they'll, for instance, will say, okay, we're going to give X person, this agency, this agency, this agency, and, and you will get like the boutique, the small agencies or none at all. Right. And um, I've had that happen. Whereas I'm like, why is this person getting, has an opportunity to make three, 400 grand. And I got the struggle to make X dollars. Nowhere near that. Those are, again, racial things. Or when people say, well, you know what? This agency works better with this group or they work with these type of companies. So what are you trying to say? Because um, I'm black or I can work with this boo-boo. You know, it's little things like that mm -hmm. that, again, they're not calling you names, but they're saying it subconsciously. And the, and the insult is they think you don't get it. You know, mm -hmm. that's the insult of the whole thing. That, wait a minute, you, what are you trying to say? That I, I'm too stupid enough to realize what you're saying? And a lot of times, if you don't believe in oneself or you feel that you have to accept it, which a lot of people, unfortunately, go to jobs every day and say, I have to just, I got to deal with it. Yeah. And yeah. again, when you realize your strength in your work and realize that every day you have the ability to change your economic stature, no matter how grim it is, we're in COVID now and, 50 million people are, are filing for unemployment. There's still somebody in some businesses that is winning. And you have to always keep the glass full. 
I'm a believer on the essence that when that reality ends, it's, then I might as well go in a box. You know, like two and a half years ago, you noticed I nearly died. You know, I could have just took the fact and said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm 60 pounds overweight, and you know what, let me just take a bunch of pills and try to last as long as I can. Well, I can try to fight and do what I did and keep working and keep grinding and be better and, and say, you know what, at the end of the day, we only guarantee two things, death and taxes. Let me keep fighting to get myself better. And I think, again, we, we're in that fight now. We're in that fight now for equality. And yeah. it's, it's been raised again. And it's yeah. never going nowhere, but now it's in our, in our eyes. We're in that fight for economic, um, economic wins. We're in that fight for education for our kids and our loved ones. We're in a fight. And if yeah. you're not ready, if you're going to just accept it and say, well, you know what? I don't want to ruffle the feathers. I don't want to lose my situation. Then you know what? End of the day, you, you, you're just a living hostage. You know, you're just a 21st century slave. And I refuse to be that. I wanted to touch when you had mentioned how as a young man or even as a child that you were taught or spoken to to be a certain way that has to do a lot to someone mentally to like so much pressure and to remember that as I live life daily on a genuine level that I have to step up 50 more percent to something that I don't even know how to be because I'm just human right right what 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 does that do? Like, what what does that feel like? How do you ever get to that point that you know the game? Like, it's like I was talking to Lenny Green. I'm sorry to bring him up again, but it was a, a great conversation. And he's a legend. You ain't gotta say sorry for bringing him up. You know, and <laughs> right now IG blocked me, so the video might not even be able to be posted. But um, he right. was how? Oh God, I just lost my thought. I just lost my thought. Mm -hmm. he'll come back to me. But like, what well, does that do? What like that? That's that includes mental health and illness and confidence. Right. That's it's emotional abuse. Right. Well, what again, like? I you know my thing is, and obviously, like I said, I don't have any kids, so my nieces are kind of like my surrogate children. Mm -hmm. And I, my niece who graduated last year from um, grad school. Mm -hmm. I always tell her that, you know, like one time she reached out to me, Uncle Kevin, you know, like it's a lot of pressure, like, you know, it's a lot to ask me from home with my mother, and my, my siblings, and, you know, she's got you know, own nieces and nephews now. And I always tell her that, you know what, at the end of the day, there's always one person in every family, at least one, you hope is everybody, but it's right. at least one where the pressure is on. And life is about pressure. And the earlier you learn about pressure, the better. Now, again, you don't tell a 10-year-old that, you know, you know, like, you don't give them all the atrocities, but you spoon feed it. Because, again, you don't want somebody to wake up when they're 21 and realize, wow, I'm not prepared for this. That's yeah. where mental illness and mental stress comes in. Because some you can only guard your kids and your loved ones so much before you have to expose them to the ugliness. Like, it's not all gumballs and, and lollipops out here. So, again, growing up, my mother, who... I'm, I'm so blessed to have my mother still here, 83 years old. She, yes, she was kind of on the church side, you know, like God's going to take care of it. You should have spirituality. So Absolutely. I got my spirituality and my, and my belief that I don't have to touch it to believe it's not there for my mother. Mm -hmm. But then I got my realist, my father, you know, um, quintessential Harlem dude, had a new Cadillac every year on bars and number spots, um, you know, I got my hustle from him. Right. So my father's realization was much different than what my mother, I mean, my mother's realization was to me. But my it's a balance, it's hope. balance. It was right. a balance. Mom gave me the hope to touch things that are not there that you can do. And that's right. helped me in my life even to this day. But my father gave me the realization to say, if it's not there, it's not there, where are you gonna find it at? And nobody's gonna help you find it. You gotta dig for it yourself. Absolutely. And that dichotomy of, of serving Bali is what I think has molded me who I am. Because again, I always roll the dice on me. I always bet on me, even when I can't see it. Even when it's times I've had 35 cents in my bank account, I've always rolled the dice on me. Because at the end of the day, 
I feel like I'm young, gifted, and I'm black, mm -hmm. and I'm going to make it. Mm -hmm. And if I don't make it, I'm going to die trying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people are used to playing it safe. I have family members and relatives. They play it safe. And I'm not, I never knock anybody for the, 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 the lane they take because sometimes playing it safe is good, you know, because, hey, I got a roof on my head. I'm not going to get too high, but I'm not going to get too low. Absolutely. I'll be all right. I don't believe in that mentality. You know, I left Wall Street um, 15 years ago because I'm like, I don't believe it. It's got to be more. You know, I tell people all the time, but I would have stayed down there. I would have killed. I would have died a long time ago because I was that stressed. You get to work 7 a.m., you leave about 9 p.m. Everybody you mess with is on the job. Your whole life is the job. You know, yeah. you might as well just keep your clothes there and take a shower at a local gym because that's that's all it is for five days a week. I didn't. I felt like it was more. And life to me is not always about money because money doesn't make you happy. I know a lot of people who are millionaires who are miserable. Absolutely. You know? yeah. So again, you got to find your light and that pressure starts with building your character. Again, there's no free lunch. And once you get to a certain age, it happens. Now, some people and some families, it doesn't happen. You turn 19, 20, 21, and you start to want to exert your independence from mom and dad. And you know what? You exert, but you don't know where to go because you've been so dependent. So you don't, eat, again, you know, and I tell my nephew all the time, because obviously I'm not the Again, when we see things that are happening around our world, things we can't understand, I think of the kids. I think of uh, a, a young kid that's, you know, watching the media and watching, you know, uh, police and watching, you know, marches and burnt out buildings. My grandparents told me that they did that so I wouldn't have to. Now I'm finding myself telling the next generation, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to do things that you don't have to. Yep. It's got to end. And I know, like we talked offline, you got to plant a seed eventually. Like, I don't, like, you might say, well, it's been happening, or it's never going to end. I'm never going to think that way because if that, if I continue to, if I put that thought in my head that this is the life we live in, then I feel like I've, I've disrespected every ancestor, everybody that's came along the way to say, you know what, you know, your, your job was in vain. I won't do that. I and maybe I won't see that. Maybe we won't see it in our lifetime. It's very possible. But that doesn't mean that that, that doesn't start somewhere. It's got to start somewhere. And, and, if, and if we're doing these, you know, these, these civil unrest and, and we're not going to take it and, we, and we're putting our foot down, then what does it all mean if we just go back to, you know, status quo? What does it all mean then? It means yeah. nothing then. Yeah. I you want know? to take a short, short break. I just want to uh, thank everybody who's tuned in. Uh, this would be shared and put on social platforms as well, media platforms. I want to say hello to Bobby Simmons. Thank you for the call in this morning to start my day. Uh, DJ Red Handed, thank you so much. Right now he's in uh, Oklahoma. He's a DJ as well industry and Travis Bivens who's a very much advocate for what's going on he's uh in rage and um I understand it uh at Sandra just want to say hello just want to say hello to everyone here and we'll continue right now with Kevin Pryor from 950 Lounge Radio Network we are collaborating on a town hall meeting zoom for Monday at 5 p.m please tune in share the flyer please get involved I want to ask you a question uh Kevin about um I was listening to someone speak and they had mentioned right. that there's no safe haven for our uh, individuals. And that literally broke my heart. Um, and it's so true. We, we don't have people fighting for us. We're fighting for ourselves. And now we're asking people that have a platform and privilege to right. fight for us. Um, that's how desperate we've become. And it's so sad. What are you feeling about that? You have mentioned something that a couple of times, I mean, we, we were talking an example about maybe if you were to take a ride up in Rockland and have a home up there and how right. you would be questioned of why you're here because this is not your territory. Meanwhile, yeah. you're intelligent, make great money, you work for the state, let's just say. I don't know how great. <laughs> huh? I don't know how great, but, you know, I hear you. Like, how... How does that feel that there's no safe haven? You can't, we cannot go anywhere that we are safe. And that is horrible. Well, again, I mean, yeah, it is horrible. 
and it, it, and, it, and it's not right. But this, I, I stem back to, again, what my father taught me many years ago, that, you know what, son, it's going to be things that are not right. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be things that are going to happen that you can't explain. Mm -hmm. So while, yes, you know, and, and to that to that extent, I was at a friend's house, North Rockland, was driving home. It was after 8 o'clock. It was in a little dark, dark roads, and I got pretty much escorted. I'm sure I got my license plate scope to the highway. But Absolutely. again, but again, it, it's, it starts with understanding that this is the world we live in. Right. Now, it's not right. And, you know, again, there are many people who stood up for us to help us break that chain. Right. Now, how do we get through that? The way we get through that is what I mentioned before, education, generation wealth. We start to do our own thing. So right. necessarily, hey, you know what? I'm not, I'm not looking for anybody's approval because I have my own, similar to how we've done our networks and how we built our brands. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, to, there's a couple of name networks that offer 950 an opportunity. But, you know, to, not to be disrespectful, but it was a it was a Kunta Kinte opportunity. And the only way I knew that is because I've been in the advertising world, they didn't know that. So right. again, we gotta, we gotta create our own lanes. You know, um, we gotta create our own safe havens and realize that, you know what? I might not be able to change um, somebody who's set in their ways. Mm -hmm. But nobody's born with racism. Mm -hmm. That's right. inherited. That's trained. Yep. That's, you know, you're not born out the, out the womb, you know, being a racist. So all we can do is set seeds. It might not be enough for somebody near our age to say, you know what, you know, I, I can't get by. Even though they, people who say, well, I'm not racist, that's fine. I can't really change you. I really don't care to change anybody who's a racist. Right. But what, we, what you need to do is respect me and respect our outer area. That's the issue we're experiencing now is because what we're, what was happening at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is giving people the battery power to feel they can say anything and do anything they want. It's right. not really about Trump. I'm from New York. I knew Trump was... Um, I grew up around the Central Park Five. You know what I mean? I, I got a profile in the city through that time. Nobody's got to tell me about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, but when Donald Trump makes a statement and somebody who sits in um, Louisville, Kentucky, or Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, or Los Angeles, California, or the New York City feels, I can say the same things the president says, that's where the problem is. Every company has a CEO. Mm -hmm. Every company has a top arch, mm -hmm. and the company shoots up. We take our orders up, and it goes downhill. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so dangerous about the White House. And when the president, who made his, uh, his way and his bid to the nomination via Twitter, has an issue with Twitter fact-checking him, I find that really comical. But, you know, it's, it's comical and sad all in the same place because – you know, if, if this, even though we know Hillary beat him by three, th three million votes, he got enough votes. Somebody believed in his ideology. Somebody that, did. That and it just came to show. Right, exactly. So it just came to show. So when people tell me, well, you know, I don't know. You know I mean, uh, he can't re be reelected. Yes, he can. You got to go vote. And before, I don't want to yeah. take where you're going. But again, the thing with Biden he ain't the greatest candidate either. Let's just call it what it is. But if I got to vote, I'm voting for the Supreme Court. I'm voting for the next 30 years. And the one thing that people have to understand is that your local elections are more important than your national elections. National elections are figureheads. Yep. But the people you put in Congress, the people you put in Senate, the governor that, that governs your state, your assembly person that helps the, the potholes and the housing situation in your community, those are the most important um, elections. But if you got to vote for president and you don't like either candidate, think of Supreme Court. Think of the, your kids and your kids' kids. And if you let Trump get another four years because you feel that Biden is a, you know, he's done stuff or he said things that, yeah, it's certainly not right. But nevertheless, he's going to put the right people in the Supreme Court. In mind. He's got no choice, you know, because he's got no choice. But eventually, we have to look at candidates and find the best candidate for us. It can't be about Democrat and Republican. Just that the, the, the Republican representative we have right now 
is 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 not equipped right to, to be the free leader of the world. He just right. he just resigned from the the World Health Organization today, I believe. Yeah. He's not he's not fit to be president, and that's where it is. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. I really don't because they all got issues. Yep. The woman that was in Central Park the the other day, the the the, the Karen, she's a Democrat. So there, there, there's racism on all ends. But you got to go with the ones that looks beyond. And again, we just look at the image of the person in office. It's not about that. It's about who they're appointing. And Ruth Gator Ginsburg, God bless her soul, that woman can't last for him. And if she goes, and while Trump is president, then you flip the coins of a conservative to liberal um, court system, which is very scary. Not only do we have to elect officials or Congress that are our own people, but we have to also start training our children and teaching our children to be involved with the communities, to be into politics in a positive way so they can grow up and want to be that voice. And hopefully we can change what the demographic is. And it's going to take years and a lot of hard work, but I believe that we should start maybe putting that in the school systems. We should start encouraging our children because it all starts from young, like you said. You know, Again. And racism mm -hmm. is not only um, it's comments and remarks and little slick little things, you know, that are still yeah. in our head. And that's basically what we're growing up with. And, and, and certain people grow up fearful depending on what remarks are being made, whether it's once, twice, or a thousand times in the house. Well, again, that that's the the thing I mentioned is that um, I can't. I'm from New York. Like we're both from New York. We're both from the Bronx. I can't rely on you, no doubt, BX all day. I can't rely on the school system to teach our kids the thing, the little, the extras. I know. You know, growing up in school, the only black they talked about was Martin Luther King and Christmas Addicts. And they never learned about Malcolm X. We didn't learn about um, Josiah Henson. We didn't learn about Marcus Garvey. We didn't learn about these things. I had to learn this stuff on my own. And by the time I didn't really, really, till I got to high school, when I started to take my own initiative to say, like, you know what, what else is out here? Because I had a thirst for knowledge. Yeah. We don't learn that. So when it comes to, like, again, building generational wealth, generational wealth is built off um, learning the stock market. It's built off, like I mentioned earlier, insurance. It's built off education. These are things that I reach out to my black and Hispanic brothers and sisters that have made it, that are on Wall Street, that earn, that have hedge funds and venture capitalist companies. With the form of the internet, you can teach anybody anything. Yeah. Okay? You can teach, I mean, again, don't, don't get me wrong. We do shows, and I love Netflix, too. But to sit down all day and exhort yourselves with TV and, 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 and social media is a joke. It's embarrassing. Yeah. And again, we, can't, we cannot continue to blame others for our demise. It's 2020. I can, I can, we're in a pandemic, right? Most of us are not working or working from home. There's a lot of extra time. So when somebody tells me they're bored, I'm, I, I challenge you to say, you're not mentally challenged. Right. Because how can you be bored? Mm -hmm. You know, again, when I see young girls, and again, people who watch my show might call me contradicting myself, but when I see young girls shaking their ass for, for money and everybody thinks the only way to make money is only, only fans, Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Now, I yep. don't knock that, but my thing is that there's other ways. Like, I was telling somebody the other day, they're like, well, you know, there ain't no jobs. No, there's no jobs for, for people who are not entrepreneur and not qualified. Right. You can go train to get your insurance license now. The one thing that will come out is people will go get insurance because the death rate is gone and there's no guarantees in life. There's options to go back and take online classes now. There's their stock courses and, and, and classes on Bitcoin. There are so many things out here. So listen, while we're talking on this conversation through social platforms, I get it. But you don't have to be on a social platform all day. Take That's that true. time out and learn. Because again, I'm not telling anybody to start a business, but I am telling you to be entrepreneurial. I am telling you to be better. And if anything, at worst, it keeps your mind from going crazy. Because half the stuff I even hear wake up some days and I go, oh my God, you know, I told you offline, like, I, I go on the street, somebody bumped me or looked at me, I, I jumped like I, you know, like somebody put a nine gauge in my face because, <laughs> again, I mean, I'm human. But uh, we got to realize that we have the 2020, the tools are all there for us to be successful. 
Like it's it, never it, been again, I can't take that. Right. I'm not going to accept that that because I'm black. And that's not changing. I'm a, I was born black. I'm going to die black. But I'd be damned if I sit here and, and grow old and not have an effect or, or try my damnness to be the best. Am I perfect? By any means, no. But at the end of the day, I realize that we all have a purpose. And it's got to be more than just going to work and taking care of your family. You got to do that. That's expected of you. That's, that's a requirement. But you have to... Somebody once told me, and a gentleman, and he's on Facebook, and hopefully you'll see it, Michael Coleman, and the guy just retired. He once told me that, you know, it's bigger, it's bigger than just you. Mm -hmm. It's The world is bigger than just you. And if you can change one life, mm -hmm. just one, out of all the people you communicate and touch, affect, love, what, one life, that one seed can then help seeds. That one seed can help. And that's why I tell people that I, I assist or help or anything, just go help somebody else. I don't, I don't care what it is. What you might feel is, is very minuscule and, and not important to you can change somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Can change somebody's life. So, you know, that, that's what it's got to be. And, and, you know, we have to be positive and upbeat, even if, it, if, it, if it's nauseating at times. Yeah. Because we need it. There's nothing wrong with going out and saying good morning. We're already social distancing. We're already losing the fabric. Everything is now virtual. We, I, I, like my show and you're, you're, you was in a studio. I was in a studio. We're not in studios anymore. We lose that. The one thing I always said about 950 that was unique and special, and people told me this, which I, I value, is that we had great chemistry. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, oh. that chemistry is now a little sterile because we're, we're virtual. But nevertheless, we have to go the extra mile mm -hmm. to keep that connection together, to keep that love, to keep that passion we need to be that as people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the situations we're dealing with now, you know, it's going to be another. Go, yep. Unfortunately, it's going to be somewhere else. Yep. And we have to realize these pains and feelings, and these atrocities that we're feeling right now, we got to hold that. And whether it's, it's healthy or not, sometimes you need a little pain. You need to pinch yourself sometimes to realize you're alive. So I, I tell you, pinch yourself once in a while because this, this pain, keep a little... Keep a little visual there because it's real and, and you should keep it with you in everything you do. Use right. it as fuel. Use it as motivation. Yep. Use it as a way to say, you know what, I'm not going to allow that to continue to happen. And it starts with our own communities. We had a man who was just president for eight years mm -hmm. that started as a community activist mm -hmm. and went to, all the way to the White House in the same hue that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Then when people, I remember when he first ran for president and won the Iowa caucus, there was jokes about Oh, it's gonna be barbecues in the White House and, I remember. and basketball courts and the hoops. And you know what? There was. And that tells you something. That the man, the man ran for president one and did barbecues in the White House and had a basketball court in the back. And so it can happen. So people take things for jokes, but reality can really happen. So one last thing. As in our communities, we have community boards, guys, that we can go to and vent and have meetings and also, every precinct in your neighborhood has an open forum for you guys to bring your concerns. So I think we need to start doing that as soon as we're able to be around each other. Not even. Put on a mask and some gloves and let's do the damn thing. But also, right. how are you feeling about us supporting uh, local business uh, businesses that are not for us? I, I feel like we need to kind of go on a strike and support local businesses and urban and Latino businesses and, and keep the other demographic kind of off our radar because we're giving our money, we're, we're, we're representing them, but no one is fighting for us on that end right. at all. Well, you know what, before I answer that, that um, years ago, I knew a friend that owned a soul food spot mm. on White Plains Road. Mm. And it was good food. I used to always go there, you know, again, when I used to eat fried food on a regular. But I used to always go there and support. And I used to say to the owner, like, you know, me being an advertiser, like, wow, like, this food is really good, man. There's nothing but black folk live in this neighborhood. Like, why is it this place packed? Right. And he said, you know what? Our people would rather go to McDonald's, <laughs> rather eat pizza, would rather go to uh, um, anywhere else. But us. But here. Oh, I cook that at home. Well, you make hamburgers at home, too, but you still go to, you know, Ronald McDonald's. So, again, to answer your question, D, it, it's a must. And most people feel like, well, you know, I don't have to support that because if they don't, if it ain't what I want, no. 
you do have a right to support because it's a trickle down effect. It's just like this. When people say like, well, um, well, if that business is out of business, so what? Mm -hmm. It don't affect me. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was talking to somebody the other day, well, that doesn't affect me if that, that doesn't come back into existence of an industry. But if that industry doesn't come back, that means there's more people on unemployment. That means if it's more unemployment, that means your taxes go up. Mm -hmm. If your taxes go up, that means your wages and the things you make are less effective because you're having to spend more money. So when you start to look at, especially your local community, mm -hmm. because that affects your crime, that affects poverty, that affects drug, that affects every life. If you own property, it affects your property value. So when you say that, well, you know what, as long as my doors, behind my doors are fine and I, my, me and my family are fed, and I got clothes on my back. That's not good enough. And one that, thing that COVID part, you're is part taught, of the, you're part of the problem. You're not a solution. Right. And one thing that COVID has taught us mm -hmm. is that it doesn't matter what I do if if this person is walking and being reckless, that can affect me. Right. No matter what. No matter what security I do, I stay home twenty four seven. Lock myself in the house. I go go get a a sandwich from the store, and somebody coughs. I'm at, I'm affected. So again, we are our brother's keeper. I say that every time and I continue to say that because we are. And mm -hmm. the day we think that it's not about us, it's about me and not us, it's the day that we lose. And I think for many years, and I think, again, it goes back to slavery, a lot of us think it's about us. And I got to get mine and hell with you. I'm, I got to get mine off. And that mentality's got to end. It's got to stop. And if it doesn't stop, it will be the ultimate demise of us as people. Because again, it's not about you right. getting yours. The pie is big enough for us to all have a slice. You know, we, we can all have a slice. So if, so what? You, you, you chop my hands off to get a bigger piece and you can't eat it? That's gluttony. But that's been the American way. That's been, you know, democracy has been built on, you know, you know, doggy dog. Right, right. But again, we realize and certain things happen for whatever reasons whatever religious what have you that make us realize that it's bigger than just what's behind my door i need to worry about what's on, in my hallway i need to be worried about what's down the block i need to be worried about what's around the corner i should worry about if the person um two blocks down doesn't have enough food to eat right to be worried about the person across the street who's out of work because again if it doesn't and i have so much well, then eventually it's going to affect me because when people are hungry, they go searching. You animals in the jungle, when they're hungry, as, as they go searching. Survival and if they go searching, it's not, I don't care about my, what, you know, what's the yeah. state. You know, yeah. I got to eat. Yeah, survival of the fittest. Yeah. You'll go desperate measures just to survive. Right. And if, and if we don't save our community, then who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Um, we have to come together as communities and stop being so ignorant or dismissive or fearful. You know, it can take one person that brings a lot of people out and just raise voices. You know what I mean? Think, think about this. You are absolutely correct. You, you're right there. Think about this. Think about if Rosa Parks never didn't have sore feet that day. And just because the status quo was to get up because you couldn't, you couldn't sit in the front of the bus. Let's say she doesn't do that. Let's say people like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King didn't risk their lives and their families' lives. Mm -hmm. Think about people like Muhammad Ali that took civil injustice. Said, mm -hmm. "I'm not going. I'm not going to kill the Vietnam Vietcong because he never did nothing to me." Right. It, it, it takes sometimes just one person, mm -hmm. and and even in a world where we're scared and and and, and we're trying to hold on to the little we got, mm -hmm. sometimes you just got to say no more. Mm -hmm. I can't take it no more. Mm -hmm. And if you sometimes say that and you say it loud enough, you realize somebody is feeling the same way. Absolutely. And you realize that, you know what, they feel like they were alone. So now they join together. Like how me and you connected. Yeah. You was doing your thing. I was doing my thing. And like, wow, we have a lot of synergy because we, we're both trying to build. Right. And while, yes, we continue to build our own brands, how cool is it when you can, you can lean on somebody and get advice and just get encouragement. And we all need a cheerleader once in a while to get that cheerleader to say, you know what? You know, I needed that push. And we all need it once in a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any word, um, any last words 
because our time is about to be up and I don't want it to just cut off on us. Right. Well, or, or again, talk about uh, what would be the goal for the town hall? What would you like to see? Well, the goal, the goal for the town hall, in my opinion, I'm very excited about that, um, mm -hmm. you know, this Monday. And, and those, for, and again, some shameless plug, 950 Live recording tomorrow, 11 a.m. on my Facebook page. Recording, so it's recorded, but it's going to be live. And Perfect. we're going to talk about it. But the town hall, mm -hmm. um, I'm excited about. And what I think it's, it's needed is a voice, mm -hmm. a constructive voice, uh -huh. a place to vent, mm -hmm. but yet come up with solutions. It's not enough just to vent. It's not enough just to say I'm angry and I'm mad. And again, we're all angry and mad. But like I said, when we first started this, it's gotta, you got to have some clarity. You know, not to take it to a criminal aspect, but real, real, real street people, they don't get mad. They get strategic. Yeah. Real business owners, people who are in marketing are sharks. They get, they get strategic. And again, when things happen and we see unrest, 90% of that unrest is strategic. I mean, yeah, we see people doing certain things, and, and that's going to happen in every, every line. Absolutely. But strategy is important and this town hall is about venting but coming out with some real solutions whether you're a part of it or whether you get a chance to listen to it on live or through a yes. portal is to say wow i got one nugget i got one thing and if we can if we can change one mindset that says you know what wow i didn't think about that or you know i do know a couple of friends that we can start that well i'm yeah. a couple of owners we can put them then we won that because again, when we can control our finances, our generational wealth, we then control who governs us. We then control who police us. The reason why we have these things constantly over because we don't own, we don't control our neighborhoods. We're so busy trying to run away. The yeah. first thing somebody, when they quote, quote unquote make it, they leave yeah. to a neighborhood or to a community that may or may not want them there. Yep. So how cool is that? How safe do you really feel just because the, the numbers say that, oh, this neighborhood has 2% crime, but everybody in the neighborhood hates you. Right. Or nobody <laughs> wants to interact with you. Right. Or your kids go to school and they're being looked upon as third world citizens. Right. Why not build it home? Think about Harlem for a minute. Harlem was, my parents are from Harlem. My father owned businesses in Harlem. My mother talks about Harlem like it was a paradise. They didn't know they were poor. They didn't know. But people looked at Harlem. Harlem had riots and burnt out buildings and dealt with the crack era. Yep. But you can't afford an apartment now in Harlem. Yep. It tells you something right there. Ghetto is not a, a place of physical form. It's a mindset. Yep. It's a mindset because Harlem was, families were was, was, was struggling to get ends meet. My mother was born right during the Depression. They didn't know they were poor because it wasn't in their mindset. Yeah, yeah. The mindset. Yeah. The mindset. So that's what I want from this town hall, to change your mindset. Yeah. To give you an opportunity to say, you know what? I'm not a third world person. I'm just as good as anybody else. And because my, I had to get through more, I'm better. And one last thing I want to add before we get sure. out of here. My grandmother, I've been around some phenomenal people, and I'm so blessed to have people in my life that have taught me. My grandmother once told me when I used to get upset or angry or annoyed or felt like I wasn't good enough, my grandmother would say, you know, Kevin, you come from strength. Those people that came on them slave ships, your descendants that came on them slave ships dealt with disease and hunger and almost drowned and all type of issues, getting beat and not knowing where they're going. Yep. And they sure. the ones that survived, you are direct descendants. So how dare you complain about anything? As I look now, COVID and what we going on, they can overcome. You can overcome. Absolutely. And if we don't continue to try to be great, we have let our decades and generations and generations of our members on all levels down. And I refuse to do that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was so empowering. Thank you. I love you, Thurman. You can love um, you connect with Kevin behind the scenes. Uh, you guys apparently worked at the same radio station company. And, uh, Who that? I didn't repeat that. That uh, Thurman from um, BronxNet. I think you uh -huh. came on panel that you guys worked at the same radio station, just never really 
kind of connect it. So I'm letting him know that, you know, you guys can connect behind the scenes if you like. My opinion. I've been yeah. a lot of places. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. He's actually still working there now, so. I'll reach out to him. I'll reach out to you, Thurman. I'll reach out to you, brother. All right. Kevin, I love you, and thank you for the, the inspiring love you too. talk. And we'll be in touch because we have some things that we got to keep planning, okay? No doubt. And before we go, I want to salute you. Um, thank you. I'm, you know, not to put your business out in the street, but, you know, again, you, you really – you really niched yourself into a personality on these airwaves. You are somebody who's an inspiration. You are somebody who's informative. And I know years ago we had the talks about kind of going a different realm. Mm -hmm. And I am so proud of you. And I'm so happy for your growth. And you're just cracking the seal. You, you need a good pair of sunglasses because the future is very bright. Thank you. I love you. Love you too. God bless. You take care. We'll talk. Be strong, everyone. Thank you, love. Take care. Good night, everyone. Thank you.